Welcome back. Today's workshop is about the power of editing and using strategies of continuity and montage to create new meaning in previously unrelated video files. I'm going to walk you through the complete workflow in this project from downloading source video files from archive.org, a large resource of video files in the public domain, to importing these video files into Premiere and then edit and rearrange and recombine them in the software so you can create a final standalone video file. I specifically am using three unrelated video sources that I have already recombined to create an outcome like this. This is Joan getting ready for school. And this is Jim, Joan's brother. You can download these source files in the comments section of this video tutorial and there you'll also find links to further resources on continuity, editing and montage strategies as well as artist projects that deal with these skills and strategies. Before we begin to work in Premiere, however, um, I would like to show you quickly how you can download video files from archive.org and how you can navigate the collection of video sources that you can find there. I've switched into the screen view and like all the other workshops that we are doing in this class, I'm also creating a new folder at the very beginning that I can use as a central location for all my media files and Adobe project files. This one I will call project two. And now I can actually go to the internet and start downloading my media files from the Prelinger archive or from archive.org respectively. Type in archive.org. So bring up the start page and I'm specifically interested in the video category on this uh, website. Click on video. And uh, one of the videos that we are going to use in the following workshop is actually in the feature film section. So I click on that, scroll down, actually don't need to scroll down too far, it's in sci-fi and horror. And the one that I'm looking at is called Killers from Space, it's right here. So you can click on that and uh, if you like you can preview the video. It's a, a little preview window. Like this. Um, if you're done and you know that you would like to use parts of this source, you can scroll down and um, below the video on the right hand side of the website you find download options for this video. I would recommend to download videos if possible and if this option exists always in the MPEG-2 standard. These usually have the best resolution and the best video quality. They also have the largest file size. Um, if this is not an option or if sometimes what happens with MPEG-2, if you cannot hear the sound because of a, a sound, a QuickTime sound playback component that is missing on your computer, then you should switch as a, a second alternative to the MPEG-4 option. Sometimes it says there is a high-res MPEG-4 available or an H.264 version available. I would go for these. If these are not available, um, almost all the videos on archive.org have the 512 kilobyte MPEG-4 option. Uh, the file size is considerably smaller compared to the MPEG-2, as you can see, um, and so will be the video resolution and the video quality. So we'll have to stretch out and scale the video a little bit in uh, Premiere if you are working with this type of video file. I would like to try MPEG-2 with this one and see and I hope, keep my fingers crossed, that the sound component will actually play um, completely for this video. So if I would like to download this, I simply hold down the control key on the keyboard of my computer and click on MPEG-2. And this will open a, a, a drop-down menu. And here I will say save link as. And I need to specify now the uh, save to location, which will be the project to folder, the empty folder that I just created in the beginning of this workshop. Click on that and say save, confirm say save again and then you see that the download starts um, here in Firefox for example with a, a 
kind of a timeline. I will show you a little shortcut right now so we don't need to download this whole video. Uh, instead I will actually use the files that you can get from the comment section of this video tutorial um, and they're already prepared. They're in an MPEG-4 format and these are all videos uh, or video excerpts that I found on archive.org that will give us some starting points already for experimenting with ideas of continuity and montage. So I can quit out of Firefox. So as you can see there's quite a few files that I've prepared for you guys. Um, some of them are called montage. So all the ones, there's actually four of these, uh, you can separate out. These are all the ones that I um, have already uh, assembled for you guys to show you certain kind of techniques or strategies of continuity and montage. Using unrelated video footage and recombining them in the timeline of Adobe Premiere to create new meaning through the juxtaposition of different shots and different clips. All the other ones that you see on the top of this uh, folder right now are actually source files. They are unaltered snippets that I found here and there at archive.org. So I can now start Adobe Premiere. And as in the workshop before, we will also create a new project when the welcome window appears on the screen. Right there. So I go to the new section, say new project. I give this project a name, call this um, editing and montage for example. Specify in the browse selection that I actually save this project file in the project2 folder on the desktop. So where all the source files are located right now. So the project file will go in there as well. And then hit OK to bring up my Premiere Pro interface. I quickly maximize the view so that the user interface fills the whole screen. And now I'm able to import media files into the project window so that I can start working with them in the timeline and in the program window to create my final montages or assemblages of uh, video files. So I go to File, Import, and uh, the uh, project2 folder is already selected. If not, you would just have to navigate to it. And uh, now I just select all the different files that I would like to import into the project. So they are basically all of the files that you see in here with the exception of the project file, which is what I'm working in here right now. If you would like to select more than one file, you can hold down the command key, the keyboard, and click on files individually like this. And you can also click on them again in order to deselect them. I would select all of these because we're going to use them, uh, most of them at least, in this project. Hit the import button. It's importing all the files and uh, in just a second we will actually see them right here in our project window. You can switch in the view between the list view, there's quite a few here, maybe the list view is a good starting point, uh, or you can also switch back to the icon view that already gives you um, previews of the individual video files. Just as a quick reminder I would like to pull up the first montage that you see in here, so montage underscore one, this one, and show you again what the goal of the first part of this workshop is. We basically would like to recreate um, a very brief uh, edited uh, vignette just like this one here. Jump to the beginning. This is Joan getting ready for school. And this is Jim, Joan's brother. <gasps> All right, so these are already three previously unrelated source clips that I used for this project. And I added them together to create this uh, rather surprising introduction of uh, Joan's brother Jim uh, that uh, is, so to say, highlighted by this gentleman's reaction at the very end of the project. In order to start uh, with uh, recreating this project, we need to find the file in the project window that is called uh, Joan Avoids a Cold. It's this one right here. And in this file at the very beginning is also the starting scene for our project. So This is Joan getting ready for school. 
this one right here. So I need to set an endpoint right here. Hit the I key on the keyboard, or you can also use the mark in or mark out selection in the source window. Play it back, and I always use uh, shortcuts, which is really quite convenient for me. Uh, in this case, it's the space bar that I use to play and pause the video. This is Joan getting ready for school. All right, and then I could also use uh, the arrow keys on the keyboard in order to frame by frame advance or go backward through the video. So somewhere here I would like to use my out point. Um, I can either use the mark out function or hit the O key on the keyboard. Now that I made my first selection, it is actually time to create a sequence that this selection becomes part of, so we can finally export uh, our video composition, our video remix. And uh, rather than creating a new sequence based on the settings of this source file, I would actually like to create a new sequence from scratch using the file new sequence command. The reason for creating a new sequence from scratch rather than using any of the source clips as a starting point for my sequence settings, this is what we did in the previous workshop uh, importing our recorded footage from the cameras, is that this time we will probably have quite a large variety of different video settings for these clips, different frame sizes, different frame per second, playback speeds and so forth. So I would like to create a sequence that is based on some very general settings for a standard 4x3 um, standard definition resolution project. And you can find um, a starting template for these settings in the digital SLR folder on the left hand side of the new sequence window. You can uh, open up this folder if it's not open yet, clicking on that little triangle and then going down to the 480p setting open this one as well and then choosing the DSLR 640 by 480 p 60 template. This will provide a very good starting point for my sequence and there's in fact only one setting that I need to adjust after I create this empty sequence to make it perfect for my project. I hit the OK button and now you see that the sequence has been created. There's also a new sequence in the project window that I can name um, editing sequence for example and now I select either the editing sequence in the project window or I just select the editing sequence in the timeline window in order to change that last little setting um, that was not yet perfect in the preset or in the template. So I go to after I select this window I go to sequence sequence settings and then in there I need to change the time base of the sequence. It's right now set to 59.94 frames per second and I would like to scale this down to the more uh, standard 29.97 frames per second. I can say OK here. Now I can actually start populating this sequence and uh, moving footage from the source window or from the project window into this sequence. So I'll start with this first clip since it's already set in and out points. Move this in here and um, change a little bit the temporal resolution so I can zoom in into the timeline a little bit more by, by using the um, by using the scroll bar at the bottom of the window respectively the end or the um, start point of this scroll bar right here like this and um, I can already play it back and see what it looks like here in my sequence window. This is Joan getting ready for school. Alright so the next step would be to have uh, the introduction of Jim. This is Jim, Joan's brother, and this doesn't happen until much later in this video, so it's uh, already pretty close to the end actually of this uh, clip that I provided you. So right here. And this is Jim, Joan's brother. So I also specify in and out points, just separating, just separating this clip. I would actually like to start right before the narrator says end. So you hear that little click already right here. So this is my end point. I move the playback head a little bit or play it back. And this is Jim, Joan's brother. <laughs> and set the out point right after the narrator is done introducing Jim. So I hit the O key on the keyboard and I drag and drop this file 
Let us click also down into the sequence again. I can play this back again just to double check. Getting ready for school. And this is Jim, Joan's brother. Now what we need to do, this is actually a very important step, is we need to continue the sound. The sound is uh, already what we would like to have for the final composition, but we would like to get rid of the image component of the second clip that we just moved into the editing sequence. And we would like to replace it with um, a clip from the Killers from Space movie. It's actually right here, the scene. So I also set an in point at the very beginning of this clip, hit the I key, go to the end of the clip right before this edit happens here. Like this, hit the O key, and then drag and drop this into the timeline. So now um, I have two video tracks and I have two audio tracks. What I do want to have in the end is still just one video track with the footage of Killers from Space and also only one audio track with the audio component of the Joan Avoids a Cold movie. So what I need to do is I need to get rid of the audio component right here actually of the Killers from Space clip and I need to get rid of the video component of the Joan Avoids a Cold clip. Right now you can see that if I try to click individually either on the video track or the audio track it always selects both at the same time. So even if I wanted to delete something and hit the delete key, I would delete both at the same time. I would like to avoid that and I would like to only uh, delete the uh, video component of track two. So what I do is I click into that track and then I go to clip, unlink. This effectively unlinks the sound from the video track. You will see that this is a strategy that you probably have to use quite a bit for this project, so it's very important to know where to choose this command from. You can then go into the video track for Joan Avoids a Cold, delete this one. I can do the same for Killers from Space, this time deleting the audio component. So I select the clip and then I go to Clip, Unlink. And then I click the audio component of this clip, hit the delete key on the keyboard, and that makes it go away. I now have a, a, a video clip that I can align with the audio of the first clip. So I use the playback head to do that. So I move the playback head at the end of this clip. If it doesn't want to stick to the end, you can always hold down the shift key which will make it magnetically jump to either the end point or the out point, end point, or the in point or starting point of a clip like that. You also see that unfortunately this Killers from Space clip was not long enough to actually fill the whole gap that I created by deleting the video component of the Joan Avoids a Cold clip. So what I can do is I can just take a little bit of the video from the first clip and try to stretch it just a little bit across this first edit so that it connects directly with the Killers from Space. You can do that by also unlinking the video component and the audio component of the first clip. Clip, unlink, and then zooming in right here at the end of the first clip. I can, with my um, selection tool selected, I can move this tool or my selection arrow to the end of the first clip see that it changes into a trimming um, tool and then I can just drag this out so that it snaps to the uh, in point of the second clip here. Zoom out and then we can take a look at the whole clip and just see what the uh, effect is. This is Joan getting ready for school and this is Jim, Joan's brother. All right, so this is already pretty convincing and you will see that very often when you make edits like this, you just have to play back the clip a few times to see is it really a convincing edit? Uh, does it really make sense or are there still some problems? And do you need to go back maybe and fine tune uh, when exactly the edit will happen. Now the last thing that is left to do is just to get the response to the introduction of Jim the gasping of the gentleman at the very end. And this is from a clip called Nightmare Castle, 
that is also in your project window. It's also a scene that's uh, in the very beginning of this clip. And here, if you see the original context, this is actually a response to a scene that follows the introduction of uh, this gentleman. We would like to actually have him be the end of our clip. So what we need to do, since the response needs to come relatively soon after we switch from Jim over to his face, we need to set our in point a little bit into the clip somewhere here. Hit the I key and then set the out key, the out point, right before we have the edit in that clip as well. Do that, drag and drop this into the timeline, and now play back the whole project. This is Joan getting ready for school, and this is Jim, Joan's brother. All right, so this concludes the first part of this workshop which just shows you two very simple strategies. The first one, setting in and out point in the source clip, bringing the source clip into the editing sequence. And the second one, separating or unlinking video and audio tracks so that you can recombine clips to create new meaning. I would now like to take a minute to show you just a few other examples that illustrate the idea of montage a little bit more, in which audience members will inevitably try to make sense of the clips that they're seeing. And usually through the juxtaposition of clip A and clip B, a new meaning, a meaning C, is emerging. This actually goes back to some very early experiments of uh, Russian experimental cinema. Already in the 19-teens and 1920s, uh, for example, through the Kuleshov experiment, theories of montage were developed. One clip that I would like to show you is called Montage 2, and this clip will introduce a gentleman drinking a cup of milk, and we will see in two different responses how we can interpret the meaning of this clip. In here, we would probably imagine that the gentleman drinking this glass of milk in the beginning is thinking about the health effects of the milk on his body, and maybe even beyond that, how the milk can put him into good shape, like this bodybuilder in the second part of the movie. Now let's contrast this with the same clip in the beginning, the gentleman drinking milk, but seeing a completely different response in the second half of the film. Here, the gentleman drinking milk is immediately followed by an image of milk cartons thrown away in a heap of trash and a trash pile with a caterpillar moving the trash around. So probably here the audience is thinking more about the environmental impact of consumption rather than um, effects on the person's health that were introduced in the first video example. It is now the specific power of montage to evoke certain kind of ideas and certain kind of responses to footage in the audience that were neither shown in clip A, the first clip, the gentleman drinking milk, or in clip B, just this caterpillar moving through the trash pile uh, alone, but through their interaction, the idea of consumption, the idea of environmental pollution uh, emerges. Just like in the previous clip, with the bodybuilder, um, the idea of health aspects following the drinking of the milk with this bodybuilder might emerge. In contrast to montage, we also have ideas of continuity, and continuity is about the idea of seamlessly stitching together previously unrelated clips so that the audience is not even aware of the edits that happen in the footage. As an example, I have this montage, I have this little uh, continuity project that I wanted to show you. Hey, Charlie, looks like we're going to have competition. That's a fish hawk up there. I don't know a fish hawk when I see one. Well, Doc, I'd say you didn't know a fish hawk. 
So here obviously we have two edits that might go unnoticed because we are following the gaze or the looking of the first character right here who is looking up straight into the sky, directs our attention already to something that might happen there. We will see the missile that is obviously moving through the sky and then this is matched by the second character also looking into the sky and then lowering the gaze and talking more toward the first person that uh, we saw in the beginning of the clip. So here if you just look at this footage you may not even be aware that there are any edits even though they are hard edits as we can see here. So it really switches from one frame to the next and the same is true of course here as well. And this is of course something that we have gotten used to quite a bit because this is a strategy that we will encounter every day in movies, in television shows and uh, in Hollywood blockbuster films as well. Let me now switch to the last part of this workshop which uh, introduces some other functions of the Adobe Premiere software that you may want to explore as part of your project number two. The first one is a question that I always receive how can you change the playback speed of footage? So let's choose a clip here. This is of course specifically obvious in characters that speak. I've been invited anywhere for weeks. What's wrong with me anyway? So let's just take that one sentence. What's wrong with me anyway? I hit the uh, in key right at the beginning here. And hit the O key here as the out point. And then I move this into the sequence window. I can play it back here again. What's wrong with me anyway? And then if you would like to change the playback speed, you would need to select the clip, go again to the clip menu, and go to the speed and duration property. That will bring up a little window that allows you to set the speed. So you can slow this down if you say 50%. It would play back at half of the speed and you will see that it will also take uh, double as much time for this clip now. So the time component is very important here as well. Slowing down or speeding up clips you will actually change the duration of your source file. And let's take a look at this. Alright, so this would be half the speed. You could also now change the speed to uh, um, a complete reversal of the playback speed. So you can go into clip and say speed duration. Put this back to 100 and then reversing the playback speed of a clip is relatively easy. You would just check that reverse speed uh, item right here. Or you could also say minus 100%. It's exactly the same outcome. Um, so it's up to you which one you're choosing. So I hit OK. Now we can take a look at that. All right, so this would be the reversal of the playback speed. Sometimes I'm also asked uh, if you can change the size of a clip or if you can change its rotation, can you change a kind of a movement across the screen or even its opacity. And all of these things are possible and I would like to take a few minutes in showing you how to do something like that. Let's start by looking at the size of a clip. Sometimes it can be, especially if you're downloading MPEG-4 files, the 512 kilobyte MPEG-4 files from archive.org, that your video files don't match the spatial resolution of 640 by 480 pixels. You would then have to stretch them out if you wanted them to fill the whole screen. Sometimes you also want to do the opposite. Rather than playing an image full screen the whole time, you may want to play it at a smaller size if you're thinking of tiling different video sources and putting them together that way in your final project or having a kind of a picture-in-picture -picture effect, for example, for uh, some other ideas that you may want to explore. Changing the size of a video frame is relatively straightforward. You have to double-click the video track in your editing sequence. Make sure that this video clip is available in the source window. And then in the source window you would go to the effect controls of this video clip. And in there 
you have uh, motion properties and opacity properties that are very important for us now to explore. Let's open up the motion properties and see how we can change them. The first one is the position property. You can see by moving your mouse over these numbers, you can actually, when you now click and move the mouse, move also, in this case horizontally, the frame. Or if you use the second number here, you can move the frame vertically up and down like that. So you can see you can also directly type in numbers to move the frame to a very specific pixel location. You can set the scale by moving your mouse right here over the scale property. And this is um, a property that is set in percent of the original size. So 50% of the size, this would fill a quarter of the screen. And so you can move this one all the way over if you like, and then all the way down like this, and then fill the screen with three other video sources that play simultaneously, or just having one larger video file that plays in the background, for example. You can, of course, also let's move this back to where it was before, rotate a video, and you can play it, for example, at an angle of uh, 90 degrees, like this. Or you can completely rotate it uh, on its head and play a video upside down, for example. These are all interesting features that you may want to explore. And um, beyond that, we have one more. It's the opacity slider right here that would give you um, control over the transparency of your video clip, like that. You can, of course, also animate all of these different settings and change them over time. This is a concept that's very powerful and it's very often used in um, video production, in animation, in 3D compositions, which is called keyframing. Keyframing is based on the idea that you set certain keyframes and certain kind of key properties of your video over time and that the computer will render in between stages from one keyframe to the next automatically for you. So you don't have to animate your settings frame by frame. You can just define key moments in time with key properties and then have the computer take over and assist you in the interpolation between these settings. We can use this example and have the video move across the screen if you like. So what I need to do is I first need to move this clip to the right hand side of the screen. I also need to be sure that I'm at the very beginning of this clip and so I'm using the playback head in the sequence window or the playback head uh, right up here in the effect controls window. Move this all the way to the end point of the clip. So you can use the shift key on your keyboard again to have this snap to the end point directly. And then I need to enable the keyframes for this specific property only. So I need to click on the toggle animation symbol, this little stopwatch to the left of the position property right here, which will turn on keyframes. And you see that there's already one keyframe that the software set for me. And now I go to the end of this clip. Again, I hold down the shift key so that it snaps to the end, to the out point of the clip. And I change the horizontal to make sure this is just one frame in, otherwise we don't see anything. So I just used the left arrow key on the keyboard to basically go into that last visible frame of the clip. And then I need to move the video all the way over until it is out of the frame on the left hand side this time. So now if I would like to play back my little animation, I can already simulate it right here. Something interesting may happen. Uh, I press the playback key. And we don't really see any video. If this ever happens to you, that means that probably reversing the video and animating it to cross the screen at the same time uh, Premiere is no longer able to give you a real-time preview, so you would have to render these changes that you applied to the effect. This is actually something rather common and the more effects or the more properties you change of a clip over time, uh, the more likely it is that you have to render these effects in order to see them in real time. 
You would actually, in this case, if you are only concerned about this last clip, set an in point in your editing sequence by hitting the I key on the keyboard and an out point by hitting the O key. And then go to sequence and say render in to out in this case. And here's the video. You can kind of see that, uh, for example, here we have a yellow line. This actually played fine before, but sometimes you get, uh, you know, a yellow line. Sometimes you get a red line, and uh, these indicate that there are certain kind of real-time playback problems, maybe with your footage. After you render these, uh, the clips, the line in the timeline here, these clips should become green, and this is a clear indicator that now you can play them back in real time again, like this. Well, this is it for today. I hope you can continue to experiment with some of the video files that I have provided you in the download links in the comments of this uh, video tutorial. Um, also, please feel free to go to archive.org, download your own video files and start remixing them in Adobe Premiere.